Good evening, everyone. I'm Sarah from the Gettysburg Library, and welcome to Chapter 3 of Dracula. Jonathan Harker's journal continued. When I found that I was a prisoner, a sort of wild feeling came over me. I rushed up and down the stairs, trying every door and peering out of every window I could find, but after a little, the conviction of my helplessness overpowered all other feelings. When I look back after a few hours, I think I must have been mad for a time, for I believed much as a rat does in a trap. When, however, the conviction had come to me that I was helpless, I sat down quietly as quietly as I have ever done anything in my life, and began to think over what was best to be done. I am thinking still, and as yet have come to no definite conclusion. One of, the th one, of one thing only am I certain, that it is no use making my ideas known to the Count. He knows well that I am imprisoned, and as he has done it himself, and has doubtless his own motives for it, he would only deceive me if I trusted him fully with the facts. So far as I can see, my only plan will be to keep my knowledge and my fears to myself and my eyes open. I am, I know, either being deceived like a baby by my own fears, or else I am in desperate straits. And if the latter be so, I need, and shall need, all my brains to get through. I had hardly come to this conclusion when I heard the great door below shut and knew that the Count had returned. He did not come at once into the library, so I went cautiously to my own room and found him making the bed. This was odd, but it only confirmed what I had all along thought, that there were no servants in the house. When later I saw him through the chink of the hinges of the door lie, laying the table in the dining room, I was assured of it. For if he does himself all these menial offices, surely it is proof that, no, that there is no one else to do them. This gave me a fright. For if there is no one else in the castle, it must have been the Count himself who was the driver of the coach that brought me here. This is a terrible thought. For if so, what does it mean that he could control the wolves as he did by only holding up his hand in silence? How was it that all the people at the bistres and on the coach had some terrible fear for me? What meant the giving of the crucifix, of the garlic, of the wild rose, of the mountain ash? Bless that good, good woman who hung the crucifix round my neck, for it is a comfort and a strength to me whenever I touch it. It is odd that a thing which I have been taught to regard with disfavor and as idolatrous should in a time of loneliness and trouble be of help. Is that, is it that there is something in the essence of the thing itself or that it is a medium, a tangible help in conveying memories of sympathy and comfort? Sometime, if it may be, I must examine this matter and try to make up my mind about it. In the meantime, I must find out all I can about Count Dracula, as it may help me to understand. Tonight he may talk of himself, if I turn the conversation that way. I must be very careful, however, not to awaken his suspicion. Midnight. I have had a long talk with the Count. I asked him a few questions on Transylvania history and he warmed up to the subject wonderfully. In his speaking of things and people and especially of battles, he spoke as if he had been present at them all. At this he afterwards explained by saying that to a voyeur, the pride of his house and his name is his own pride, that their glory is his glory, that their fate is his fate. Whenever he spoke of his house, he always said, we, and spoke almost in the plural, like a king speaking. I wish I could put down all he said exactly as he said it, for to me, it was most fascinating. It seemed to have in it a whole history of the country. 
He grew excited as he spoke and walked about the room pulling his great white mustache and grasping anything on which he laid his hands as though he would crush it by main strength. One thing he said which I shall put down as nearly as I can, for it tells in its way the story of his race. We Zelskis have a right to be proud, for in our veins flows the blood of many brave races who fought as the lions fight for lordship. Here, in the whirlpool of European races, the Ugric tribe bore down from Iceland the fighting spirit which Thor and Woden gave them, which their berserkers displayed to such fell intent on the seaboards of Europe, I, and of Asia and Africa too, till the peoples thought that the werewolves themselves had come. Here too, when they came, they found the Huns, whose warlike fury had swept the earth like a living flame, till the dying peoples held in their veins ran the blood of those old witches, who, expelled from the Scythia, had mated with the devils in the desert. Fools, fools, what devil or what witch was ever so great as Attila, whose blood is in these veins? He held up his arms. Is it a wonder that we were a conquering race, that we were proud, that when the Mygar, the Lombard, the Avar, the Bulgar, or the Turk poured his thousands on our frontiers, we drove them back? It, is it strange that when Arpad and his legions swept through the Hungarian fatherland, he found us here when he reached the frontier, that the Honfogos was completed there, and when the Hungarian flood swept eastward, the Zelskis were claimed as kindred by the victorious Mygars, and to us for centuries was trusted the guardian of the frontier of Turkey land, I, and more than that, endless duty of the frontier guard for, as the Turks say, water sleeps and enemy is sleepless. Who more gladly than we throughout the four nations received the bloody sword, or at its warlike call flocked quicker to the standard of the king? When he was redeemed the great shame of my nation, the shame of Kosova, when the flags of the Wallach and the, Mag and the Magar went down beneath the crescent, who was it but one of my own race who, as Vovid, crossed the Danube and beat the Turk on his own ground. This was a Dracula indeed. Woe it was that his own unworthy brother, when he had fallen, sold his people to the Turk and brought the shame of slavery on them. Was it not this Dracula indeed who inspired that other of his race who in a later age and again and again brought his forces over the great river into Turkey land, who, when he was beaten back, came again and again and again, though he had to come along from the bloody field where his troops were being slaughtered, since he knew that he alone could ultimately triumph. They said that he thought only of himself. Bah! What good are peasants without a leader? Where ends the war without a brain and a heart to conduct it? Again, when, after the battle of the Mohawks, we threw off the Hungarian yoke, we of the Dracula blood were amongst their leaders, for our spirit would not brook that we were not free. Ah, young sir, the Zelskis and the Dracula, as their heart's blood, their brains, and their swords, can boast a record that mushroom growth like the Hashburgs and the Romanovs can never reach. The warlike days are over. Blood is too precious a thing in these days of dishonorable peace, and the glories of the great races are as a tale that is told. It was by this time close on morning, and we went to bed. Mem, this diary seems horribly like the beginning of the Arabian Nights, for everything has to break off at Cockrow, or like the ghost of Hamlet's father. 12 May. Let me begin with facts, bare, meager facts, verified by books and figures, and of, of which there can be no doubt. I must not confuse them with experiences which will have to rest on my own observation or my memory of them. Last evening when the Count came from his room, 
he began by asking me questions on legal matters and on the doing of certain kinds of business. I had spent the day wearily over books and, simply to keep my mind occupied, went over some of the matters I had been examining at Lincoln's Inn. There was a certain method in the Count's inquiries, so I shall try to put them down in sequence. The knowledge may somehow or sometime be useful to me. First, he asked if a man in England might have two solicitors or more. I told him he might have a dozen if he wished, but that it would not be wise to have more than one solicitor engaged in one transaction, as only one could act at a time, and that to change would be certain to militate against his interest. He seemed thoroughly to understand and went on to ask if there would be any practical difficulty in having one man attend, say, to banking, and another to look after shipping, in case local help were needed in a place far, far from the home of the banking solicitor. I asked him to explain more fully so that I might not by any chance mislead him, so he said, I shall illustrate. Your friend and mine, Mr. Peter Hawkins, from under the shadow of your beautiful cathedral at Exeter, which is far from London, buys for me through your good self my, my place in London. Good. Now here let me say frankly, lest you should think it is strange that I have sought the services of one so far off from London instead of some instead of one resident there, that my motive was that no local interest might be served save my wish only and as one of London residents might, perhaps, have some purpose of himself or friend to serve. I went thus afield to seek my agent, whose labor should be only to my interest. Now suppose I, who have much of affairs, wish to ship goods, say, to Newcastle or Durham or Harwich or Dover, might it not be that it could be with more ease be done by consigning to one of these ports? I answered that certainly it would be most easy, but that we solicitors had a system of agency for one another, so that local work could be done locally on instruction from any solicitor, so that the client, simply placing himself in the hands of one man, could have his wishes carried out by him without further trouble. But, said he, I could be at liberty to direct myself, is that not so? Of course, I replied, and such is often done by men of business who do not like the whole of their affairs to be known by any one person. Good, he said, and then went on to ask about the means of making consignments and the forms to be gone through and all sorts of difficulties which might arise, but by forethought could be guarded against. I explained all these things to him to the best of my ability, and he certainly left me under the impression that he would have made a wonderful solicitor, for there was nothing that he did not think of or foresee. For a man who was never in the country, and who did not evidently do much in the way of business, his knowledge and acumen were wonderful. When he had satisfied himself on these points of which he had spoken, and I had verified all as well as I could by the books available, he suddenly stood up and said, Have you written since your first letter to our friend Mr. Peter Hawkins, or to any other? It was with some bitterness in my heart that I answered that I had not, that as yet I had not seen any opportunity of sending letters to anybody. Then right now, my young friend, he said, laying a heavy hand on my shoulder, Write to our friend and to any other, and say, if it will please you, that you will stay with me until a month from now. Do you wish me to stay so long, I asked, for my heart grew cold at the thought. I desire it much. Nay, I will take no refusal. When your master, employer, what you will, engaged that someone should come on his behalf, it was understood that my needs only were to be consulted. I have not stinted. Is that not so? What could I do but bow acceptance? It was Mr. Hawkins' interest, not mine, and I had to think of him, not myself. And besides, while Count Dracula was speaking, there was that in his eyes and in his bearing which made me remember that I was a prisoner, and that if I wished it, I would have no choice. 
The Count saw his victory in my bow and his mastery in the trouble of my face, for he began once again to use them, but in his own smooth, rest, resistless way. I pray you, my good young friend, that you will not discourse of things other than business in your letters. It will doubtless please your friends to know that you are well and that you look forward to getting home to them. Is it, is it not so? As he spoke, he handed me three sheets of note paper and three envelopes. They were all of the thinnest foreign posts and looking at them, then at him and noticing his quiet smile with the sharp canine teeth lying over the red underlip, I understood as well as if he had spoken that I should be careful what I wrote for he would be able to read it. So I determined to write only formal notes now, but to write fully to Mr. Hawkins in secret, and also to Mina. For her I could write in shorthand, which would puzzle the Count if he did see it. When I had written my two letters, I sat quiet, reading a book whilst the Count wrote several notes, referring, as he wrote them, to some books on his table. Then he took up my two and placed them with his own and put by his writing materials, after which, the instant the door had closed behind him, I leaned over and looked at the letters which were face down on the table. I felt no compunction in doing so, for under the circumstances I felt I should protect myself in every way I could. One of the letters was directed to Samuel F. Billington, number 7, the Crescent, Whitby, and another to Air Lutner Varnia. The third was to Couts and Company, London, and the fourth to Heron, Klobstock, and Bilrith, Bankers, Budapest. The second and fourth were unsealed. I was just about to look at them when I saw the door handle move. I sank back into my seat, having just had time to replace the letters as they had been and resume my book before the Count, holding still another letter in his hand, entered the room. He took up the letters on the table and stamped them carefully, and then, turning to me, said, I trust you will forgive me, but I have much work to do in private this evening. You will, I hope, find other things as you wish. At the door he turned, and after a moment's pause, said, Let me advise you, my, young, my dear young friend, nay, let me warn you with all seriousness that you should leave these rooms. You will not by any chance go to sleep in any other part of the castle. It is old and has many memories, and there are bad dreams for those who sleep unwisely. Be warned. Should sleep now or ever overcome you or be like to do, then haste to your own chamber or to these rooms, for your rest will then be safe. But if you be not careful in this respect, then he finished his speech in a gruesome way, for he motioned with his hands as if he were washing them. I quite understood. My only doubt was as to whether any dream could be more terrible than the unnatural, horrible net of gloom and mystery which seemed closing around me.